And so you work with, um, you've worked at the Olympic Games and you work with athletes. And what have you observed working with athletes or observing with, you know, high performance athletes or entrepreneurs or high performance people? What are they doing to be in the top 1% of their field that the other 99% are not doing? Yeah, I, I think it's big part is their work ethics. Like I think it's grit and the ability to show up and do the work when no one else is doing the work. So I think that's it. And I see, you know, I might follow some other high performers and I see that played out. Um, they're willing to reach out to experts. So I've coached two women now to win world titles in water skiing. And, you know, the the first, you know, recognise, and, you know, she's got an awesome story and she wrote a book around it. She was number two in the world in her 20s and then realised in her, as she was coming up, she was like 38, 39, she's getting close to 40 and she's going, I'm as fit as I was then. She was hardcore because she would train hard. She goes, I think I can actually get that number one spot because I'm smarter than I was. Mm. And she reached out and said, what I need help on is the psychological piece. Yeah. Is you know, how do I handle setbacks? So in the in the world titles, she was out in front in the first two and there was like four rounds. Third round, she sputtered in badly. And then come the fourth round, so it was the work that we did together that allowed her to psychologically let go of that third round and, mm. and come into that. So I think it's, uh, it's definitely grit. Um, it's definitely looking for expertise. Um, it's being willing to make mistakes and and knowing that those are opportunities to learn and grow from. And, you know, always consciously, like, looking at what do I need to do to improve this thing. You know, I would do, for myself personally, I'd do a presentation and then at the end of the presentation as I'm walking out, I'm already thinking about how I could have done it better. Mm. So these, you know, high-level athletes without judgment of self, you know, which is ego-based, yeah. but with curiosity, they're looking at, well, well this is what do yeah, I need to do to tweak this thing? Yeah, and, and the word that comes to mind with that is observation over judgment. So if you made a mistake, if you fuck something up, if you could have done something better, what is the energy that you are sitting in with that event? Are yeah. you Can you observe that and go, okay, all right, That's I can do that better and... Or are you like, are you in the state of judgment of yourself? Yeah. Like you yeah. fucked it up, like yeah. you idiot. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's a very key distinction. Yeah, well, that's a key distinction in life. So this book called Power Versus Force by Dr. Hawkins, these levels of consciousness, like being able to move beyond ego-based living to this, and I call it love-based living. It's like when we let go of all of that stuff and get into that, that's when we are just like open-minded, like looking at this thing because we're curious about life. Mm. We're not driven by survival, survival instincts, you know, competition and all that sort of stuff. Like, you know, a recent thing I heard about competition was old mate who came up with the idea of survival of the fittest, Darwin, like, you know, another guy who had a hypothesis around the same time prevented, presented it to the, I think, the Science Society at the time, he was a commoner, whereas Darwin was a like elitist, was in the upper class. So Darwin's thing was survival of the fittest, which s definitely supports the there's the people who were chosen into this thing. Mm. This other guy whose name was um, Wallace, I think it was, was based in Malaysia at the time. And what he said was evolution was based on um, the dying off of the weakest. Yeah. Like, you know, that's the thing. So the group actually keeps evolving up. It's not yeah. these, you know, people who are the competitors that are sowing their seed that are taking evolution up. It's still falling away of the weakest. Yeah. And that's life and that's like the evolution of life. And again, we've gone down the rabbit hole of like mm. philosophies on life, this idea of, you know, if you don't take care of yourself, like you might be part of this, you know, you're passed out of the evolutionary cycle. Yeah. So it's not so much about competition. It's like how can I fortify myself? How can I create that right community around me? Yeah. How can I surround myself with these other people, draw on these other resources, and collectively, you know, then we can rise together.
Do you have a process for decision making? Like, I mean, so <clears throat> as an example, like one thing that I would do is if I've got a business decision that I've got to make, uh, I'll just write down everything. I'll just brain dump everything. Like I'll write yeah. down all my notes. I'll do spreadsheets. I'll like run different scenarios and I'll get it all on paper. Once it's all done, then, you know, I might look at it for a little bit, but then, all right, I'm going to make, make a decision. Yep. That's my process. Just brain dump everything. And then that way I know what I'm working with. Yeah. I mean, if you want to be more structured with it, it's like, it comes down to what state am I in when I'm making that decision. So I'm big on, you know, yeah. what's my physical state? Am I dehydrated? Am I tired? Am I hungry? I don't make decisions when right. I'm in that That's state. That's probably why most people make shit decisions. Exactly. Because un- a lot of people are unhealthy. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, there's that piece. Am I in the right emotional state to make this decision at the, the level I want to mm. make it based on, you know, these consequences? The other one is... Um, Do I have the high quality intelligence information to make the decision I need to make? And where I think people are having a challenge at the moment is their level of discernment is low. Our level of discernment is low if we're in a fearful state of mind. Our level of discernment is high. We're in a calm, relaxed state. We're able to sense truth. Mm. When we're sort of, you know, flustered or tired, hungry, whatever, whenever we're not at our best, we have less capability to discern truth. So we might be in our decision-making process using information which we think is fact, which is really assumption and maybe a poor assumption or maybe even a non-fact. Obviously, there's a lot of things going on. There's COVID, there's lockdowns, there's politics, um, there's a whole bunch of other things that people don't even know about which are related. Yeah. Um, but what's your what's your favourite? Like, well, actually, <laughs> another way, what's your least favourite? <laughs> what's the what's the one that makes you like the ha- the hair stand up on your? And I'll tell you why. So one of the first training courses I did. So I graduated from the military college, went into Royal Australian Engineers. The first specialist training course I did was the Defence Against Nuclear, Biological and Chemical Weapons. Um, Part of that training course, we were like going into, you know, military um, practice gas chambers where they would let off CS gas and you had different PPE equipment on, so Mm. different protective equipment on. And I know you'd go into this gas chamber, they'd flick the switch and then they'd sing out gas, 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 and you'd put on these purpose-built military grade mass and if you didn't have a good tight rubber seal you'd be sucking this cs gas in your nose would be running eyes would be burning so as soon as there was this talk around you know putting a piece of cloth over your mouth to what's, stop what's, something, what's cs gas um I, like, I can't even remember it's like tear gas or something yeah very similar right. to tear gas very similar to tear gas so it would wipe you out. And so this idea of a, a cloth mask, like stopping anything, for me is just so ludicrous. So to see that and to see people actually believe it, mm-hmm. and I want to go and sort of poke my finger in sort of cavity spaces on people's mask. <laughs> so that's my thing, like, yeah. you know, and I, and I know lockdowns don't work. Like, again, unless you can you know, seal everything up and you've got an air filtration system in, like someone sitting in an open-air cafe in Bali, you know, oh, it's okay to take my mask off because I'm eating or whatever, but then they sit at home yeah. and they've got no mask on and it's exactly the same air. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to narrow it down. To it's one, it's one either we're stupid. all wearing masks <laughs> all the time or, or we're not. Like if one person takes off their mask to take a sip of water, it ruins the <laughs> yeah. whole thing. The charade is broken. My, my thing is, you know, when, when is the signal for the taking off of masks? Is it, uh, yeah, it's now okay to take it off. You listen to a Dr. Zach Bush who says in the air alone there's 10 to the pair of 30 viruses just in the air. Mm. So, you know, if we buy into this for this story, like do we wear masks for the rest of our lives? Yeah, and like, I mean I think even even bigger than that is – what what gets me and my least favourite is the <clears throat> just people uh, people's complicit nature of um, just 
wanting it to go away. They just comply because they just want it to go away. And I think yeah. that's the most dangerous thing. Like when people say, uh, I'll take the vaccine, not because I believe in it or don't believe in it, but because I want to get my life back to normal. Like yeah. that to me is the most dangerous attitude to have. Yeah. And if there are people at the top pulling strings, you know, playing games, that's exactly what they want. That's exactly yeah. Yeah. what they want. Thank you.